five, four, three, two, one. Ignition, lift off, center five, aim high. Alrighty, so today we are going to be discussing Bitcoin. What is it? How does it work? Should you invest in it? This video is sponsored by our friends at Raycon. Oh yes, these are the best earbuds on the market. We'll get to that a little bit later. So what is Bitcoin? Some people think that Bitcoin is just a giant scam. Some people think that Bitcoin is the wave of the future. So we have people who are pro-Bitcoin and we have people who are anti-Bitcoin. On the pro-Bitcoin side, of course, you have Elon Musk, very, very pro-Bitcoin. You have the Winklevosses. They are very pro-Bitcoin. On the con side, you have people like Peter Schiff. He's very con on Bitcoin. You have Michael Berry from The Big Short. He is very con on Bitcoin. To explain what Bitcoin is, first, you sort of have to understand what money itself is. Now, I know what you're thinking. Well, it's, it's right here in my wallet. That's what money is. Yes, that's what a physical dollar is. But what exactly is money supposed to do? So from the earliest times, people have found a way to convey value to one another in pieces of exchange that are not actually the items of exchange. Let's say that you have this guy and this guy loves oranges. He grows oranges for a living, right? That's what he grows. And he wants to trade with this guy. And this guy grows apples for a living. Okay, they could just trade the apples for the oranges directly, but what if the problem is this guy doesn't actually need oranges or this guy doesn't actually need apples? Well, then what they do is they find a different method of exchange, basically an IOU note, right? And that IOU note can go in any form, right? You can have an IOU note that looks like a seashell. This is what many early cultures did, right? They'd have an IOU note that was a seashell. He doesn't know how to use the three seashells. Then it became that the IOU note was basically done with the value of gold. Okay, so in America, and for a long time in the West, the standard for this was the gold standard, that every dollar that you spent was backed by a certain amount of gold. It used to be that you could take a US dollar and you could trade it in at the Federal Reserve and you could get back some gold. Then along comes FDR and FDR severs the value of the dollar in gold, right? During the FDR administration, FDR decided that he didn't like that the American dollar couldn't just be inflated. Because see, the thing is, you can't just create extra money. When you just create extra money, you're not actually creating extra underlying value. So what that actually means is that, let's say that the government has a big debt. Let's say that the government has a debt of a million dollars. Well, you would say, well, they need to come up with a million dollars in taxes, right? They would need to come up with the value of a million dollars in order for them to pay back that debt. What governments quickly discovered and have known for a very long time is that there's another way to pay off that million dollar debt. And that is to go in the back room and just print off a million dollars and then hand you all that monopoly money. Now you may feel screwed. And in fact, you will feel screwed. And you're not gonna wanna do transactions with that government anymore. But this is one way that governments get out of their own debt. It's one way that governments can spend without actually having to tax additionally or to withdraw resources from an economy. So FDR decided he changed the value of gold arbitrarily. He just decided we're going to inflate the amount of currency versus the amount of gold that's out there. Okay, but the United States wasn't completely off the gold standard until 1971. Richard Nixon decided in the Bretton Woods Agreement that the United States would no longer rely on the gold standard at all. And this made the dollar a fiat currency. A fiat currency is a currency that doesn't have any underlying value. The dollar is instead based on the full faith and credit of the U.S. Going all the way back, seashells were only worth something because they thought, okay, well, that farmer, he's going to be able to farm something, and that IOU note is going to be worth something after he does his farming. The same way, the federal government is reliant on your full faith and credit in them to eventually come up with the money to pay you back for the amount of money that you have in your bank account. Right? That's the way that dollar value is established, is through the full faith and credit of the United States. Okay, so all of that is backdrop to what Bitcoin is, because I've just explained how fiat currencies work. And inherent in there is an explanation of why people probably should not trust fiat currencies. So people who have been looking for a repository of value that is not dependent on centralized government have been looking to other sources for a long time. Thanks to the rise of the digital world, you're using your credit card for virtually everything right now. But that credit card is predicated on dollar value, for example. What if you could do transactions with pretty much anyone and you could do it without having to refer to the dollar. You wouldn't have to worry about central banks. You wouldn't have to worry about governments blowing up the value of the currency. All that a Bitcoin is, is a belief that other people are gonna use the Bitcoin. So, who created Bitcoin? Supposedly, it is this guy right here. Supposedly, his name is Satoshi Nakamoto. Now, the reason I say supposedly is because nobody actually knows who created Bitcoin. And supposedly, it is this guy who's supposed to be 40. 
and from Japan? That's kind of awesome because you don't want to have a centralized guy who controls all of Bitcoin, some mastermind criminal who actually can inflate Bitcoin at any point and then sell all of his Bitcoin for a bunch of money. You want it to be decentralized. That is the purpose. The basic idea of Bitcoin is that you are concerned that this right here, the full faith and credit of the United States or any government, it doesn't mean anything, right? What if you are worried about that? What if you are worried that the government can simply devalue dollars? Well, then you need to find another repository of value. So what Bitcoin is, is you believe that the currency is stable enough to be used and enough people are going to accept the currency that it has inherent value. Instead of you relying on the government's ability to tax and the government's ability to stimulate and the government's ability to print and to take it out of circulation, instead of relying on all of those powers, you're relying on the idea that there is something that is trusted by enough people that they will use that in the absence of a government. So you're giving up a certain amount of faith in the pure unbridled power of government in favor of faith in other people believing in the same IOU notes that you believe in. This is why some people like Peter Schiff, like, that's a pyramid scheme. Because just like any other temporary repository of value, people could fall out of love with Bitcoin. And that's true. People could fall out of love with Bitcoin, or they could find a new version of Bitcoin. You see new sort of currencies springing up every so often. So theoretically, you could have people decide, you know what? We don't want to use Bitcoin anymore, or businesses say we're not going to accept Bitcoin as payment anymore, and the value could theoretically go to zero. That is 100% true. It also happens to be the case that Bitcoin cannot be controlled from the outside because governments can make currencies worth zero, but governments don't have the power to make Bitcoin worth zero. That is because Bitcoin is not a centralized currency. It is a decentralized cryptocurrency. So that comes with some costs and it comes with some benefits. On the cost side, you cannot rely on the ability of Bitcoin to give you some sort of hard asset in exchange for your Bitcoin because that doesn't exist. That's not what Bitcoin is. On the good side of the ledger, you don't have to worry that the creators of Bitcoin are going to simply inflate the value of Bitcoin or deflate the value of Bitcoin by simply printing new Bitcoin. In essence, here is sort of the difference between fiat currency and Bitcoin. Fiat currency is a government, right? Call it the U.S. government. And the U.S. government decides the value of the currency, and then that value is promulgated to all of the other human beings, right? These are all the citizens. All the citizens are out here. Yay, citizen. Okay. And then we have an unhappy citizen. So the value of the US dollar is decided by the US government. When it comes to Bitcoin, it is precisely the opposite. Instead, you have a bunch of people out here, and these people have to decide what they think Bitcoin is worth. And because Bitcoin is not an actual government, who's actually creating the value of Bitcoin. Instead, you have all of these people investing their own assets into Bitcoin. So the definition of value is incredibly different. The definition of value is coming from the outside in as opposed to from the inside out. There are some who say that Bitcoin is worthless. It's not valuable. But then there are others who say that you can trade Bitcoin for something truly incredible, like these. Now, the reason that people call it a cryptocurrency is because the technology of Bitcoin, the thing that prevents it from being inflated, is that there are a set number of Bitcoins in circulation. A certain number are being added every year, but it's a very, very low number. The Bitcoins that are in circulation cannot be jacked around with. They cannot be counterfeited. And that is because the crypto technology that is used in order to encrypt the transactions. Right? People are using cryptography. They are using actual cryptography in order to protect the transactions that take place. And you've heard of this thing called blockchain. What blockchain technology essentially is, is every time somebody uses a portion of Bitcoin for a transaction, they're an entire group of people. They are called Bitcoin miners. And their job is to simply verify the transaction. Their job is to try and unlock all of the cryptography in order to ensure the transaction is legitimate and to make sure that you can't use the same cryptocurrency twice, right? This is sometimes what people worry about is that somebody has a Bitcoin and they simultaneously give the Bitcoin to two different people. That can't happen thanks to blockchain technology. So once a certain number of transactions are verified, that is called a block. Every time the, the Bitcoin miners create a block, it is added to the blockchain, right? With every block that is added to the blockchain, you are creating a more and more unbreakable chain of events and more f faith and credit in the Bitcoin itself, which is why it's good, right? You can't even understand how these transactions are verified, but you know that they are being verified and they're being verified in real time over the course of time. And you earn Bitcoin for doing this, for participating in this process. So you actually have a really transparent look into all the transactions that have been done with Bitcoin. So you know that people aren't screwing around with the currency. And that, of course, is the chief promise of Bitcoin is that people are not screwing around with the currency because, again, no one is in control of the Bitcoin. There's not a centralized person who decides how many Bitcoins ought to be issued. There's not a centralized body that decides whether to inflate or deflate the currency. And so that means 
that Bitcoin is entirely reliant on how many people decide to use Bitcoin. This is why Bitcoin has gone from essentially a zero value proposition, what appear to be people spending dollars for zero things. And now Bitcoin is worth up to $50,000. The answer is the more people buy into it, the more the Bitcoin is worth. So in that way, it really is no different than gold, except that gold is a hard asset and Bitcoin is just a digital asset. One of the things that has happened here is that you've seen some big companies like Elon Musk, big believer in Bitcoin. His company, Tesla, just bought $1.5 billion in Bitcoin. What is he really saying? He's really saying that I believe more in this value as a repository of value than in something like a US bond or a US dollar. I believe that this is going to grow in value as people turn away from centralized governments and fiat currencies in favor of a currency that is not controlled and not inflatable by outside parties. And as the economy grows more and more reliant on government spending, and as people see that governments are never going to pay back these debts and that governments are going to continue to run up those debts, people like Elon Musk are probably going to do more and more of this. You're going to see more and more people say, okay, you know what? I'm going to take my money and don't feel like investing in gold because I can't use gold for actual transactions. It's a good repository of value, but I can't use it for actual transactions. And instead, I'll just put it in Bitcoin because I can still use it at the local grocery store. And also, it happens to hold my transactional value. So the government has a couple of worries about Bitcoin. Number one is that if people start investing in Bitcoin instead of worrying about the US dollar, that means there are fewer people who are buying bonds. Theoretically, you could buy this as a holder of value over the long term, and you're gonna do that instead of buying government debt, so the government can't actually issue more debt, meaning they can't raise more money to pay for all of the various projects that they wish to engage in. The other problem for governments is that when you're talking about a completely digital currency that is not controlled by them and not verifiable by them, they're worried about the possibility of this sort of currency for criminal use. There are a thousand reasons why you might not want the government to know how you are transacting business. If you happen to be a libertarian, you don't think it's the government's business how you transact business or with whom you transact business. If you are somebody who believes that the government is badly motivated and would seek to crack down on Bitcoin holders for some reason or remove the value of Bitcoin in some nefarious way, the more closely Bitcoin is protected, the less government has the power to do all of that. There's always a flip side of the coin. <laughs> there is a pirate vibe. The reason there's a pirate vibe is because anytime anybody acts entrepreneurially outside the auspices of government, it feels like a pirate is doing it. We have just been conditioned to think that way. But these people are not criminals. They are acting outside the scope and authority of the government in the sense that they are creating a rival to the government's main asset, which is your full faith and credit in their system. Remember, Bitcoin goes up when faith in the system goes down. If you have faith in the full faith and credit of the United States, you're buying bonds. If you don't have faith that the United States is not going to inflate the currency, you're buying Bitcoin. Right now, cryptocurrencies are exploding. Facebook has its own currency. You have Potcoin, which is pushed by, I guess, Dennis Rodman, along with pistachios or something. You have Ethereum, you have Litecoin, you have a bunch of different types of cryptocurrency. Anytime there's a market for any sort of digital currency, there will be rival digital currencies. The question is which one gains credence in the marketplace. It's why at the very beginning, it takes big people buying into this sort of stuff to make a difference in the market for it, right? The more Elon Musks you have buying into Bitcoin, the more faith there is that Bitcoin is a real thing. So at the beginning, it does appear to be incredibly volatile. Whether those succeed or fail is largely and actually entirely based on the public view of whether those things are going to succeed or fail. Right? This is why so many people are skeptical of cryptocurrencies in the first place. But my feeling is that over time, cryptocurrencies, particularly ones that find a place in the market the way that Bitcoin has, I think that those are going to continue to rise. I think as we have less and less faith in centralized governments, and it seems to me that we are right now, as that happens more and more, I think you're gonna see more and more people looking to diversify away from fiat currencies and instead moving into places like Bitcoin for actual safety and security. Despite all the talk about volatility, it may be that in the future, the most volatile forms of currency are the ones coming from centralized governments with an ax to grind, as opposed to a decentralized group of people who simply wish to engage in transactions that hold their value. Merci d'avoir regardé la vidéo. Si vous l'avez aimé, mettez un pouce. Et si vous voulez faire partie de la famille cosmique, abonnez-vous. Si vous désirez nous soutenir pour notre travail, vous pouvez trouver le lien Tipeee en description. Merci, à bientôt. Bisous.